and you're watching Notes, a Paratif's behind the scenes interview series featuring Detroit's house music community. The producers, DJs, management, the least talked about logistics, media, photography, venues, patrons, promotions, and merchandise. Yes, Detroit has it all. Our set location and host for this segment is Kenilworth Cafe, located at 9405 John R. Detroit, and co-owned and operated by DJ Larry Vibe Maker Miller. Thank you. A 36 year plus significant role and roots in house and techno music is one I sit down with today passionate producer and DJ, directly speaking his thought and what I call an international rock star and also an international bang the box <laughs> rock star, which are those whose talent and expertise is sought worldwide from big production stages, audience and interviews I welcome Theo Parrish. Thank you, sir. Welcome, welcome. You me in. <laughs> All right. Are you ready for this? Sure. Okay, yes. now. Now I'm a little bit scared of you. <laughs> uh, you scared of me. Now let's take it to the booth, front and center, right. as we take this journey into your life as a producer and DJ. Okay, yeah. Where were you born? Grew up? Yeah. And at what age did you realize you wanted to produce house and techno music and become a DJ? <laughs> That's a whole lot. It, uh, I was born in D.C. And then shortly after my birth, my mother brought me to Chicago. And then we were talking uh, from for as long as I can remember to, I don't know, until I went away to school. Um, I was in Chicago. Uh, and the funny thing about Chicago, you didn't, when you, when the music hit, you really didn't have a real choice. It was, it, it just kind of grew around you. It wasn't a thing where you was like, I'm going to DJ, I'm going to produce, or we even, we even didn't really even have a name for it. Because remember, we got it two generations after existing. So in Chicago, I was about, at the time I got it hold, it got a hold of my ass. I was about 13, 14. And so. I need you to speak a little louder. Okay, yeah. And so if anyone knows, everyone knows that there was like two generations ahead of before 15 and 16 year olds at that age in Chicago at the time, which are now pushing 50, which is when I say, I'm between 40 and 50. And so it came up around us without you making a choice about it. The only choices you made were really simple. You had either the, the Vice Lords, the GDs, or you mm. gonna try to be like Mike, or you stay in the house, mm -hmm. or you in the music, and the music protected you because there was such a high recruitment at the time. Like every everybody you knew was in either vice or you need money. Your voice is dropped again. Uh, okay, where's the mic at so I know where that's at? Because I was talk towards that. If the mic's at, I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna pull up a little. <laughs> All right, so so it wasn't really a choice. It was more like it just happened around us, and it kept us out of trouble. Like every weekend, I was in the house with my two buddies, and we were learning how to mix, learning how to mix, mixing this record, out, going to track records. Every weekend, with what little money we could, and getting a like four dollar record, which was crazy, and go 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 home and mix it. We only had enough for like one at a time, and so it was like it wasn't really a thing where you chose it because it was still exclusive. Mm -hmm. We go to these parties and. You couldn't walk up on a DJ. You didn't even know what equipment. You didn't know, wasn't no asking nobody what a record was. Mm. No, hell no. Like, you could get beat up for that. Like, try, really? Yeah, trying to even get over to the booth. There were so many people around the people that were playing. It was like, it was crewed up. Because remember, Chicago's tribal. And wow. Like, and triple the population of, of Detroit. So you got that, you got that, that, that density where you were a thing like it wasn't it wasn't just the music it was a cultural identity mm. we're talking about you know a, a relationship and an understanding of your african roots mm -hmm. and how egypt plays into that and how how the cross was an aunt and all these different things that you really 
you really don't get off into it until a lot older, but we got put in, we got put to it early because of the other oppressive forces in the But it was a uh, 13, 14 is when it started, and it was more because I would hear on the on the mix shows because I wasn't going out yet. I would hear the songs wouldn't stop when they they and I realized my boy was like, yeah, they use a mixer and there's two turntables. I'm like, oh, and then we realized they use a piss control turn. Like it was like this whole mystery of what equipment to get, then how we got skills, and it was never with the promise that we would get paid a dime. Wow. It was no we had no money, no. And besides that, every block there was a guy that was just as good as you had just started playing. Every block over and one block up. We talking this thing was widespread. It was every but it was ours. It's totally ours. And I'm gonna say this. Can you imagine house music without white people? That's what it was. That's what it was. And that's and a lot of people that makes people uncomfortable. Because for part and parcel, or parcel, they own it now. Although we're the creators, we wrote it, but they own it because they own the market in which we eat right. from. Right. Right. And so the question is we have to have ask some serious cultural questions. At this point, even though we know that they're necessary for our survival, and it's not yes. a they, it's a we. Because we're past just the white of it all. And we have to remember this too as African Americans, it only plays out a percentage of how that works, how we're conditioned at home. Mm -hmm. We gotta start talking the colonial thing if we start getting into really how we make this equal. We gotta start having conversations with people in Europe, with black people in Europe. How come when we come over there and play, ain't, ain't none of y'all opening up for us? What's that about? How come the only ones that go are always light skinned? Mm -hmm. you know, all these different things. And don't they know that over there, the light skinned ones over here are wilder than the light skinned ones over there? Because y'all came from love, we came from rape. So it's like, but nobody want to think about that on the dance floor. Nobody want to have those conversations. But, but we can't have those conversations if we're still at an economic incline. Like, we can't talk about balance if every time you put a booking on the table, they ask you to go, you don't you don't want to budge, move your budget. You just pick another pony. And it's like, all right, we leave as artists, but we land as the help. And that's the part that, that kind of made me want to stay all back. Um, I understand that. And please know this. Mm -hmm. And I would like for the audience to hear this as well. When I first thought about doing this, yeah. I'm not doing it so people can just come, over, come on and talk whatever. I would have never had you requested if I could interview you if I thought you would not speak your mind. And that's what I would like for everyone to do is to speak their mind and speak what's in their heart. Yeah. Some of it is gonna be a look rough, it might, it might, oh, tough. Oh, 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 it might, right. it might, yeah, right. you know? Right. Call, hey. But if we all can grow, but more than if that, we all can grow. Let's just tell the damn truth. Tell the let's truth. Let's just tell the truth. Because we're, we're, we're in an interesting situation being in Detroit. There's two things that make it kind of difficult. And these are, these are beautiful things though. We have the benefit and the burden that any gig that we do, when the music scene shows up, and this is the thing about the house music scene in particular, we're, we're aging out. Yes, we are. We need youngsters bad. So we got to get out of those 10 cuts we like and start going to some of these other ones and hearing stuff if we're going to see and recognize new talent and teach these young. See, they know, they know how. They don't know why. They don't know why you scream when the beating hits like that. They need to know why. And, and that's the thing that the elders have, is that we have the bravery and the, and the generational compression of needing to snap. And yes. nobody knows what snapping really is. It happens to you, but they don't know why it happens, how it happens. But when you get around other individuals that are looking for those with the right environment for that to happen, you can go down the path with them. Now, now you got a community. That that dynamic is very difficult because in Detroit, we have such a small population density at this point that everybody in the crowd is somebody that you either know, love, or respect, or is in mild competition with you, or open, or open aggression. <laughs> so the equivalent of somebody snapping like they would in New York and Chicago in Detroit is <laughs> so anywhere else, they're doing backflips, they fall on the ground, baby powder, like in Detroit. Like, <laughs> I heard your little song, dog. In other words, he just basically just like, oh my God, it's amazing. That's Detroit. But that's also the reason why when we leave out of here, it's lights out. 
wherever we go. It's right. lights out. Right. It's lights out. It's lights out. We go anywhere. They scared. They hate us when we show up, and they hate us when we leave. But they gotta respect it. And they gotta keep coming because we just gotta hit. All right. Age of compression. Now, what brought you to Detroit? My mama. My mama. <laughs> she she fooled me. I love it, but she fooled me. She told me I could. I was I was down in Kansas City to finish my degree, and I was happy to be free parental control. So I was just. I had finished school. My obligation to my parents was done. I had me a little bike, a little, little mountain bike. And I was at a theater taking tickets. And I had finished my degree. I was happy as a clan. And up in school, I had do some DJing around there. And down in Kansas City, I actually, actually got introduced to jazz and hip hop and reggae all okay. in Kansas City. Because in Chicago, it was deep in, in, in tracks. And so what people call deep house is not what we call deep house. What we call deep house was like either like jazz, what people call jazz funk or disco or uh, boogie or whatever. But it usually had to do with the reason why you called it deep was because it was heavy. It was heavy music. It was laden with, with real intention. It was not easy to play. It wasn't nothing light about it. It wasn't like a lot of the poppy stuff that we hear from other bands places. And we had tracks, which is basically the hard edge tracks, like Larry Heard stuff. It's all his stuff in there. Anyway, I don't know where I was going with this. Well, I went down. I had asked. You asked me a question. What brought you to Detroit? That's what it was. Yeah, my oh yeah. And then I was playing over there, and I was happy to just be there. I really wasn't doing much, but I was happy to not be under control. And then, uh, then I got booted out because my landlord wasn't coming around, um, paying the mortgage on the place. So I got booted out. My mom was like, "You know what? I was gonna get another place." She was like, "Why don't you come on, save money?" Da, 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 da. I said. Nah, I'm cool. She was like, you live rent free. And I was like, all right, I'm coming. <laughs> so That's what brought you all that's here. That's what brought me to all the right. church. But then I got here, that was not the case. My step boss was like, nah, you're going to pay some money. And so, but that was the best motivator. Yes. Because what that did was, that made me go out and get any job that I could find. The first job I got in Detroit when I was living in my mama's house was at Poor Ray Lee Cafe, which was 19. Oh, yes, I heard about that. Yeah. We used to make sandwiches and call. And who owned? Tree. <laughs> tree with who? Grace. Tree. Tree. Yeah, Tree. I know Tree. I just know him as Tree. I don't know his last name. Okay. I just know Tree. Big old Tree. And it's now what? It's called TV Lounge. It's Absolutely. It's Directions uh, Cafe Upstate. Oh. I mean, not Cafe, Salon. Directions Air Salon. Salon. Okay. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. I have here in my hand my notes. Yes. This has evolved from 28 to 40 mystery questions. Okay. Of which you have randomly selected six. Yes. Bwah. Yes, six. <laughs> okay. Okay. There is much information available in the public domain about Theo. Mm -hmm. So if, so audience, if there is something you'd like to learn about him not discussed here, please check him out on the internet there are plenty of articles, yeah. interviews, as well as uh, videos, inter uh, video interviews. Now, I, let's get yes. down. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Okay. What does <laughs> STFU mean and <laughs> when does it apply? All right, STFU. This is the idea that Along your life, you need to be able to assess the thing that you do compulsively, that you need the most control of. Everybody's got it, but you got to get control. Mm -hmm. Mine, I talk way too much for my own liking. So I made a note to self, shut the fuck up, shut up, you talk too much. And the reason I talk too much is because I'm, I'm worried about people misunderstanding. So I over explain. Because often the issue that happens with brothers like me, from where I'm from, once you go get to your paper receipt with your, with your fancy words and everything, you lose the ability to be able, sometimes, depending on who you are, the ability to be able to speak simply and directly. And so that no matter whether you got the toolbox to talk, boardroom, can you survive at the liquor store? And you need that you need that wide range to be able to deal with the environment. So that's just me. I need I need to go soon. 
that's that's SDF you to know like okay maybe this ain't the point to be talking about that and maybe that ain't the point to be talking about this. Mm -hmm. So note to self. All right, I love it. Okay, question number two, which is question number four. Okay. What has another artist shared with you that continues to be wise advice? This is the best piece of advice I've ever got. This was Sheikh Shakir, Anthony Shakir. Really? Yeah, Sheikh. This was, I had the first release of my new, when I just dropped, I just got the Vice of Sound Sage for number one. And I ran into him to give him the record. And I and he was clear, like it was not that long after I'd been in Detroit, and i tell you, I love, I love Detroit's like that to this day, but it's getting a little softer. Let's, okay, just, let's keep going. Let's just keep going. Okay, so um, uh, when I got here, I was not accepted very, very quickly. As I really? Saw. No, not at all, no. When I first got to Detroit, no. People would mess with me. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Because if you think about 95, everything was popping in. And I didn't really realize it when I showed up. I just thought that it was just like, I had great record stores in like Chicago and everywhere else. I didn't realize it was like, I didn't know that there was a whole travel thing happening. And I didn't know people were going overseas and stuff like that. I had no idea any of that. I just know that when I would come here, I'd get the craziest records that I would get out of my collection. When I would come, I was way in school. And I met, like through coming up from school to go, cause you know, my parents moved from Chi-Town to uh, Detroit, and so it went from me going to the record store there, when, when I went to school, when I come home for holidays and stuff, I just walk down, walk, walk down the street now, 7 Mile, and it remind me of 71st uh, Street in Chicago, mm -hmm. and then I run into, this, I walk past the store, and I see all these records, I was like, word, and I go in there, and, it, and, and, and this was back, and no, before I went in, I saw this green, this green 5.0 Mustang with white interior, and I seen this dude get out, this big football playing dude get out with this Versace haircut. This was back when Rick had hair. That was Who? Rick, Rick Wellhite. Oh. When he had the, the he, had he, hair. Had, he had the forest green and white drop top mustache. Oh, this is who you're talking about. Yep. Oh, okay. When I rolled up the buy right, and I didn't know I was Rick meeting Rick White. And I and I he had, he had so many the first person put me up on Blaze was Rick. He, he gave on me, what? Uh, Blaze. Blaze. Yep, it was written. Uh, particularly a song called Baby Lover. I bought that, and then I, from then on, I, I, every time I come 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 um, come from school to see my um, my people in uh, Detroit, I'll go to Byron. And it went from me and Rick, and then it was the short dude with these pink pumas, real soft spoken. That was King. Pink. <laughs> okay, hold on. Wait, wait. Yep. I gotta re regroup. You gotta regroup. This pink. Is, this is before no. Moody Man. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, this I met Kenny way before Moody Man. Way before the Moody Pink Man. Pumas. Pink Pumas. With the white stripe on. And he had the white Monte Carlo with the rag top, with the messed up rag top, with the burgundy beat up rag top on. <laughs> back in the day. This is back in the day. This is when I first got here. And I would just keep coming back and keep coming back to Detroit and keep going to the record store. And I just didn't know the cops were, I didn't know that was going on. And so to this day, it's a lot easier now for people to come, get, get Detroit it all out, get some seven mile dust put on, you go run it off and go get I some like fees. That. Seven mile dust. Put some seven mile dust, you know, some Grand River. <laughs> put some, you know, put some Brightmo on you and then go, <laughs> you go run off. And it works two ways. You can go out there and do your thing, but you still gotta come back here. Cause the beautiful thing about Detroit is, when you come back here, you know as a quote unquote international DJ, that you cast a home and tell you what. Yes. And the reason why yep. is because they got a harder crowd than you ever will because they play in Detroit all the time. They make small rooms of highly educated motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing about that though. I've seen Detroit be real soft on some corny out of towners though. They love an out of towner. They love a New Yorker that ain't doing nothing. They love her. They love somebody from somewhere else. They love that. They love it, y'all. They are real easy on people my time, as long as they don't come with the ego. If they come in trying to, like, put the stomp on things, y'all will turn y'all back so fast. I've seen a million times. Somebody, like, I, I see an opener, a killer. Opener for a Detroit, for, I mean, a, um, an international come in, 
as long as they follow the energy. Because we don't trip people up when we bring guests in. We give, we, also, we, we give them off the glass a lot of times. All they got to do is bring the next one and you be perfect timing, all that. We don't want to make you, we want you to be your best so that you don't talk shit. Right, so, <laughs> so this, is, this is a story for you yeah. about how we turn, turn well, we're hard. Hell so, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I agree, the talent here is amazing. Because of and I had a promoter get upset with me because I would not get on the dance floor. And and I told the the promoter how I felt, and um, I was really surprised that they wanted me to be something that I am. They want you to be a spark plug. That I I love being a spark plug, but I have to fill it, and I wasn't filling it, and I'll just leave it at that. But now, the question was. <laughs> but I love how you, you know. You know how I go you, 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 I'm you so are great. Lost it. You are a great storyteller. All the way out. All right, okay. I got it. I know where I, I know where I got to go. Frictional Shakir, first record. Yes. Right. So I'm giving him the record. He goes. He sees the record. He saw. He saw. I had the three one three on it. Like the number. He's like, you know, Theo. I know you got the three one three on the record. He's like, all right, you release some records now. That's good. From Chicago, but you got three, you know, three on the record now. It means that record's from Detroit now. And he said, You get 10 extra seconds at the turntable. Don't waste their time. That's what he told me. And that stuck with you? That stuck with me. Ever since, I've been thinking, like, you get 10 seconds, like, because your records are from Detroit, you get 10 extra seconds at the turntable. Don't waste their time. Don't waste their That's time. What? That, what? And then and from there, I was like, word, you know, I just, yes, sir, you know, like, and I, and I, and I took it, I took it serious because I knew I was from shot. I knew, I knew it took, it took a long time for people to even respect my methodology of playing and also to respect my intention. Like, it wasn't going to be no come in and bop off and blow up, no. None of that. And it shouldn't be. You should never be. You should never be able to go to a city and just because you're from that city become successful. You better put in work. That's what I love about Detroit. People, you can you can run that for for so you don't run out of breath and run out of tank. Because when you get back here, there's gonna be so many people actually really about making that life for real, for real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm. Question number three, yeah. which is ten. What has been the most challenging room you've played? Germany. Germany? Yes. It was challenging room, and here's why. I was told to stop playing. I was told to stop playing. It was challenging because it felt like bold face racism in the worst way. But in a, but still diet. Still diet racism. I got booked to play at the Berg Hunt. So what I, was it? Panorama Bar in Berlin. I was scheduled to play from four to six in the morning. Oh no, sorry, two to six in the morning, four hours seven. I'm playing, everything's going well. People drinking, carrying on, everything's cool. I decided to drop tempo. Now this is before, this is like almost 15 years ago. I dropped tempo, I go into that JD remix of Busta Rhymes, that, uh, Dragon thing, rah rah rah, the dragon, baby, stop, blah, 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 blah. and the crowd goes, through. the room goes nuts. The owner comes over to me and says, "You stop playing right now." And I was like, "Why?" No, stop playing. Too much soul. Oh no! Oh, you coming off? I, I kid you stay not. Stay in frame here. Yeah, I kid you not. You booked me from Detroit, and you told me to stop playing because it's too much fun. So in other words, too bad for this moment is what you're saying, but yet still, you booked me. Ooh. Wow. If I had never seen you try to engineer what kind of faces they wanted in their building, it was that. That was challenging because 
I knew I had the room. I knew I was killing it. I knew that they had booked me on the basis. And I knew that there was some other techno beater downstairs that I was kicking my ass and putting people upstairs. I knew all that. And I also knew too, if I had charge $5,000 more dollars, they wouldn't have gone Now let me ask you this, two part question. Yeah. That was 15 years ago. Yeah. How did that affect you emotionally? It took me As you're playing. Oh, it, 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 was, it was terrible. It was almost, as, it was two times. It was almost a tie, because it was almost the same thing in two places. Something happened to me at, at uh, no, 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 at, uh, at the Paradiso in Amsterdam, when it was in December, and they were having that uh, Blackface Festival. Was Blackface? Some, yeah, December, two, look it up, December 4th through, I think the 7th or something like that, they have this festival called Zwarte Pete, it's Black Pete. In their celebration of Christmas, Santa Claus has little black elves, little black face elves. And guess what the people do there in, in celebration? A lot of white people walk around with black face and black afros. And they do that for Christmas. They still do this. And they did this when I was playing at the venue. All I know is I'm, it's midnight. I'm, dry, I'm playing pattern snapping. I look over. There's three, there's three white boys in black face. Four black face. Afro wigs, the whole thing. I, I just started crying. I just started crying. Yeah. I couldn't believe I was in a situation like that. But this was similar to that, except this is the dude who booked me. And I, you know, then it's clearly, you just want, you said, you start Detroit, you start Techno, you book me, and now you mad at you. Yeah, we everything. We everything. Detroit's everything. We're not just Techno, we're not just right. You late. You late. Y'all been calling other people's music under one little moniker because you just simply are too lazy to investigate it further. You're good with these three and then these six to come after, but never mind the 36 and 124 and all these other ones you ain't got names for yet. Mm -hmm. But we're aware of and knowing that y'all just want to go on and use because by the time we can look, next question. Now, <laughs> well, I had a two parter. Yeah. 2022. If that were to happen to you today, mm. I wouldn't care what country, what venue, I wouldn't even care who was there and how much money they dropped for that ticket. If that happened to you today, 2022, what would be your response? Well, see, so Wait, if an owner asked you stop. to stop playing. I wouldn't even be in a position where it would, it would, I would be able to be told to stop playing because it's simple. I, I simply charge too much money for them to tell me to stop playing. See, when I told him to stop playing, I told him to get my fee. I'll stop playing. He did. He got my fee and I left. And I was mad because he shouldn't have been that. Easy. It shouldn't have been that easy for him to go run my cash. I should have. I should have been dumb. Mm. Because at that point, he would have reconsidered. Or better yet, he'd have took a look around his club and said, "You know what? He's beating me. I'm just upset that it's not the way that I wanted it to be." Yes. You know, and that's that's typical. They buy a service. They say Detroit. They expect X, Y, Z. They're not interested in you particularly. They're interested in what it is that you bring, i.e., the mystique, the halo of Detroit. So whenever you use it, you got to put something on it. You got to put something with it. Halo of Detroit. That's yes. beautiful, um, Theo. I've never heard Detroit right. described like that. And that's that's really beautiful. Okay. Um, wow, you got me really thinking here. Okay, what advanced technology has been most influential in your evolution? My evolution, the MPC 2000 XL. Okay, can you repeat that again? The uh, MPC 2000 XL. And can you tell our audience what that is? That is a, a programming machine made by Akai and uh, it basically, as far as I'm concerned, um, is one of the most essential pieces of uh, creative gear a musician. And I would say musician, not a beat maker, not a producer, but a musician needs. And I say musician because eventually a DJ becomes a producer. Eventually a producer becomes a musician. Mm. Um, if you're on the path long enough, eventually you're gonna find that one methodology that puzzles you and excites you. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's arrangement, sometimes it's composing, sometimes it's pure playing, sometimes it's uh, sound bank stuff. For me, 
that machine is the NPC 2008. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the most unusual thing that has happened to you in the booth? In the booth? Now, you're in the booth. Something I saw or something that happened? Because this is kind of both. Well, I want you to answer it the way you want to answer it. So right. I gave you the question. Yeah. And you All can right. answer it however you want to answer it. All right, I was cross scenes. And I'm playing this super famous club. And I'm noticing that there's a really drunk dude in the front. Super drunk. To the point where his eyes are almost going back in his head. I'm like, how is he standing, right? Look. Alright. I look over at him and I look away. And I look back. And he's looking at me. Look back at me. These pupils were black. <gasps> okay. These pupils were black. His whole eyes was black. I decided I was not going to look over there <laughs> the rest of the time I was playing. So I just kept looking at him like, nope, I ain't see that. Nope, I ain't see that again. And what I do? I look back over him. Whatever it was, was looking right at me and kept, and, I, and it went on for the duration of that song. And then eventually, when I look back over the dude, it disappeared and moved on. Strangest thing hands down I've ever seen in my life that happened to me. That, that was, that was- Like crazy. a piercing black. We talking about tape. All right, limo tent, limo tent side glass. <laughs> a second ago, my man was there. All of a sudden, he's not there no more. And I'm like, okay, this is crazy. I'm just going to keep playing the song and not trip. Now, when you saw the pupils were, was it the pupil or the whole eye? Talk about the whole eye. The whole eye. The whites of the eye, too. There were no more whites of the eye. There were no so more what was the first thing that ran through your mind? Watch it. Oh. Yeah, we'll watch it. There's wow. Watch it. Wow. And if you're familiar with some of these things that go on, there's, there's watchers, there's tellers, there's seers. There's a lot of, and this is the other part of my nightlife that nobody likes to talk about. The reason why we need this music a lot of times because of tensions and things that are on us, the tensions we carry, it's release. When we release, sometimes those things that we're involved in have a hard time letting go. And sometimes we can get involved in certain things that really don't want to let you know it's the moments like that. And this is why it's very important for you to be very, very clear and intended when you play music for people. And depending on how you play, I choose to get emotionally involved in music. Part of that burden is that now you're going to start seeing stuff jump out of people. Now that's going to be clear to you. Because you're, you're, there's a lot of like for instance. Some people play with a certain amount of distance. They have the music, they have the tone, there's them, and then there's a song. How they make it, how they do it, how they use the music. It's very pragmatic, very scientific, but often you find that they have great transitions, perfect names, but they bore you to shit. Mm -hmm. Or if you, if you take their image away and listen to them, they'll bore you to shit, although they might have a great story, visually, or whatever. That part is getting on my nerves now. Just because you have an interesting personality doesn't make you an interesting DJ. It doesn't make you qualified to tell stories. Now, what 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 what, so what does qualify you to tell a story? Other than than what the people qualify to tell the damn story. And if you're not playing for your peers, then of course younger people are gonna prop you up as the biggest thing. But but try playing to some people that understand it. Try to, try playing to a wide range. Try playing to, a, to a, 10 people in a room, not a thousand. Easy to make a thousand dance. Come on, make 10 dance and nobody here. Now you're talking some Detroit shit. I just had that experience <laughs> yeah. where only four people showed up and so um, people snap. <laughs> four people danced and it was really a beautiful, it was really a special moment because they got up That's and right. they started dancing. Right. Okay, moving right along. Yeah. What is the first thing you do when you get in the booth? Sort my mixer. And then so it's like either if the mix is already sorted, ready to go, already did sound check, it's sort my records. If it's if there's no sound check and I'm coming in straight from it, it's set the mixer. Okay. And this is a question, because um, we're done with the mystery questions now. Yeah. 
So I want to ask you this one. Okay. Brand new venue, you've never played it. Yeah. What's the first thing you take note of when you walk through that door? Sound system. Do they have do they have bottoms, tops, and highs? Are they is the system built into the room? Um, is the boot separate from the room? Is it the stage situation? Is the boot situation? Um, what's the bar? So how far is it from the dance floor? Is the dance floor? Are we in the basement? Is this, you know, like mm -hmm. all the, but more than anything, I don't care about your bar that much. I don't care. I care about the floor a little bit. I care about that system most because that's, that's the main link. So the system is, is paramount. Okay. Now. Um, I want you to respond to this question. Sure. So recently, and I love to pitch ideas to different people. Yeah. So I pitched an idea about an event to one of Detroit's top promoters mm -hmm. and to one of Detroit's top venue owners. Yes. When we discussed the talent lineup, mm -hmm. they said, we have to have Theo Parrish on this bill. Respond to that. Cool. Hire Mark Dunn. <laughs> yep. Hire Mark. I'm Can there. you explain? It's, it's simple. And who is Mark Duncan? Mark Duncan has down is Detroit's best sound engineer. Period. There's people that get more use, but in terms of that deal, yeah, anybody can, you know, everybody knows, loves to drive GM and you know how it works and all that. But when we're trying to really immerse people in something, trying to care about it, it's Mark Duncan, period, for, okay. for Detroit. For does, he, does he do most of the sound when you're, you're having your own promotion? For, for he's, been, he's been doing my sound since I started doing my own party with the music gallery. The music gallery. Yes, like I, 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 have, I own one of his systems, so if, you, if I'm playing, Nine times out of ten, I'm playing on this season. Okay, very good. All right, moving right along as we wrap this up. What are you learning right now? Woo! How to balance, how to balance. Um, and, and the balance is personal, professional, creative, family. All those different things. Social, which is not existing. But that's mm -hmm. okay. Because sometimes I almost have to just so that doesn't. So it's. So it's like a uh, selective dial on my time and attention that I'm learning. Like, which ones can I integrate? Which ones are a dimmer switch? Which ones are just totally binary? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like this, but not that. That and that kind of go with this can, but that can. So, okay. Yeah, balance. Now, what are your current residencies and projects? Okay. Um, I, right about now, I've been homebound. So, being homebound meant that lots of production. So, I. Um, I've been working on a folded for Miss Marissa Rose, which is... Oh, I absolutely love her. You know, she's a very excited about it. And then there's a, um, there's a full length I, I just, I'm wrapping up now, actually. And uh, doing a comp for an outside company for a lot of Detroit uh, artists. A lot of new Detroit artists coming up. It's a comp for IK7, where DJ kicks you. They flip that on his ear. Okay. Hopefully. And... Yeah. Are you doing any residencies? Yes, I'm, I'm playing at a place called Spotlight, but that at a place that I, I, an event I'm doing with them called the Get Down, which is uh, similar to, to to music gallery, but not quite as that as that is more at a bar. I mean, we're just more going in for for we're not trying to undo a lot. And the thing about the gallery is the gallery is all ages, and it's, it's meant to be something in the community. The music gallery? Yes, that's the one that, that I do. This is an offshoot of the music gallery. This one was more of an idea of uh, production uh, display and also kind of also kind of similar to the gallery in that I want to walk people through this on a Sunday. So the idea... The spotlight? Yeah. That's on a spotlight. Sunday? Yeah, that's on a Sunday. It's the last Sunday of the month. And the idea is that you can come early, you can come late, you can come. It's more for this serious musical aficionado that wants to come and dance, hear a good tune or two, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily want a, 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 a Friday night vibe that, at that moment. Although you can, I'll walk y'all in and party and question mm -hmm. what, because we gotta, we gotta get it. But in terms of it being the thing, you know, 
everyone can come to. I like that. You can come at five, you can leave by seven. So like, you know, it's a lot of grown folk. We 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 ain't, we, ain't, we can't we gotta go to work. You know, we ain't trying to. We can't be. We're not thirty. We're not twenty. Like, and that's the part that nobody wants to address is that you know the house music community for every if you into it by this point, hey. You're looking at the AARP and all that, you know? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's going down. Like, but we're still here, so we got to start having some serious health conversations. Start here and have some real mental health conversations and, like, you know, things like that. But part of that is, too, is you want to make it so that you can actually go get it. Sunday Sunday afternoon, you come for an hour, Jack, and then get up out of it. Now, you're, you're fresh and ready to go for the next day. And what is... What's the time break? It goes from 5 to 2 in the morning. So there's no excuse. And you're playing the whole time? The whole time. I might have a guest or two from time to time pop in a live performance in the beginning. Okay. Test some new material. But, yeah. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to say or want us to know about you? About me, no. But about Detroit, I will say this. Never underestimate talent. And the truth of the truth. But not what you think. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> now, how can people follow you via your webs or websites and social media? Well, there's uh, the soundsignature.net. I can be reached there for products and things. And then uh, I got a got the soundsignature Patreon going on with new material and stuff coming. And uh, and that's it. I'm gonna email soundsign at gmail.com. All right. This has been. It's been great. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. <laughs> Here, Theo Parrish. Uh, I, I can't believe it. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. So much. Um, there is so much more to come. Collaborating with others across Detroit's house music community is primary focal point of everything that I do. I look forward to sitting down with you, so stay tuned. Thank you for watching, and please, if you enjoy this show, hit the subscribe button and we will see you next time. Do it. <laughs>